Hey everyone, good evening. Hi. Hi, Nick. Thanks for coming out uh, to this wonderful, wintry April Nebraska JS. <clears throat> Just a couple quick announcements, uh, the same announcements before we start any meeting. Um, of course, thanks for coming. Uh, thank you to Blue Cross Blue Shield for the room and Jonathan for getting that set up. So. Thank you to Isabel and Agape Red for the food and drinks, so thank you, as always. <clears throat> um, we have a code of conduct, so please follow that. It's at nebraskajs.com slash CFP, uh, and if you have any C -C. questions, sorry? C-O-C. C-O-C, not CFP. Yeah. I'm going to talk about the CFP next. C-O-C. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, so please follow that. If you have any questions, uh, talk to me or Zach. Uh, and... Oh, that's Zach, over there. And um, CFP, we uh, are running a conference, the Nebraska JavaScript Conference, on July 27th of this year. Uh, it's going to be at the, did we, did we announce the? It was a secret. All right, don't tell anybody, but it's. <laughs> <laughs> Very poorly held secret. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's going to be at the Holland Performing Arts Center downtown. Uh, so really exciting, uh, oh, really excited about that. And the CFP call for proposals or presenters uh, is open until Sunday at midnight. So you have until then to get your talk in. We really, really, really like local speakers, so we want to promote them. Uh, Jessica, you spoke at it last year. Uh, did you enjoy it? Yes, absolutely. I enjoyed the talk. I think Ooh. it was a very popular talk, so thank you. Um, and we, we want to uh, highlight the talent that Nebraska has to the world and also bring in some talent from the world to Nebraska and highlight that and just have a fun JavaScript filled fun day. Uh, so it's um, papercall.io slash nejsconf2018. Uh, but we'll tweet that out and post it to the, the uh, meetup as well. We'll send an email on the meetup for that. July 27th. Thank you. It's a Friday. And any um, events that you'd like to, to let people know about that are going on? Uh, uh, somebody told me that people are meeting uh, on Friday to discuss that, myself included. So, yes. About <laughs> <laughs> uh, the right time to talk about it. It is, yes. Uh, it will be probably in uh, June of this year. But let's not talk about that outside of this room either. Fun, <laughs> fun announcements. <laughs> We're all insider stuff. Um, but yeah, that, that'll be coming up. If you haven't been to one of those yet, it's just a celebration of the tech community in Omaha. Uh, it's a party that we try and throw twice a year. Um, the last one, it's usually around the holidays, so there was one there um, around uh, early December, and then there's usually one between April and June. Um, and they're both, we're big enough now that they're both usually at the slowdown. We get something like 400 to 500 people coming, uh, but it's all sponsored, and there's uh, free food and drinks, and it's great networking, we give away prizes, a lot of fun. Uh, a great way to meet other people who do JavaScript, do uh, Python, do design, do any kind of tech work in Omaha. Uh, they're there usually, so it's, it's a good time. Uh, just watch our Twitter and we'll, we'll send out an announcement about it as well on the meetup. And any other announcements? I don't think so. So uh, with that, uh, we have Stephen Haberman today talking about uh, our classes and prototypes different. Is that mm -hmm. good? Uh, yeah, and like how different? Because they are different. Uh, but, you know, to what degree and, yep. and that sort of thing. Cool. Nuances. Yep. Take it away. Thank you. All right. Please get the lights. Oh, sure. And they'll, they go a little slow, but they'll adjust. There. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, hello. Uh, my name is Stephen uh, Haberman, and I'm going to talk about, as Nick said, uh, classes uh, versus prototypes. Um, this, uh, you might have seen it in the announcement, this started out as a blog post, I, I did not mean for this to be a presentation, uh, but had, uh, was writing a blog post really to kind of synthesize my own internal learning. It, you know, a lot of times when you write, you, you know, that's how you kind of distill your, your own knowledge and that sort of thing. Uh, so that's what I was doing about a week ago, and I got to the end, I was like, you know, actually maybe this could be a presentation, so I, I sent the link to Nick, uh, and he said, how about Tuesday? <laughs> so, so here I am, here we are. 
And uh, yeah, so next, there we go. So, so what's the fuss? So why talk about this? So the reason I was thinking about it is um, there's a variety of these, you know, kind of prototypes or awesome blog posts floating around. Um, here's three that I kind of highlighted that I think uh, you probably would be surprised if you've already read. You, you may not recognize the the titles, but um, they're fairly uh, well read in the uh, JavaScript community, I think. And basically, that they they either directly or or indirectly kind of assert that you know kind of this old school classical notion of you know class based inheritance is 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 very complex. It, it leads to uh, you know really deep class hierarchies and fragile base classes and all sorts of abstract methods and this and this and this and this. And it's just kind of a bad thing and then you know prototypes are this magical new way of doing things that makes everything amazing. And uh, I, I've read these, you know, it seems like every two years or so I'll, I'll for whatever reason have a reason to Google, you know, re re Google them and reread them and I never really you know, stayed with it enough to feel like I, I internalized it. So that's what I was doing last week, and um, kind of what all, all you know the conclusions I'll go through, or maybe not conclusions, but thoughts and musings. So, uh, for me, the um, I'm going to start with class base first. So defining terms. So there's actually different. You know, class base can be different ways. Uh, I've done a ton of Java in, in my you know that was my lot in life for a long time. Uh, I don't want to ruin my street cred, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I'm kind of kind of take the, the Java C plus plus ish you know static OO you know uh, notion of class. So you can also do like more dynamic classes like like Python and that sort of thing. But I'm going to stay in kind of the, the Java world. Uh, and then I also like to think visually. So we'll we'll, we'll kind of see uh, how that works out. But uh, I'm going to start with class base first. I, I don't know if that's just because that, that's what I started with, but um, you know that, that's what I want to start with. So. Uh, let's take an example here. Uh, so in inheritance, you always see animals and dogs and cats, right? So you've got an animal sort of base class, and you've got a dog that is an animal, and a cat is an animal. So that's that's the domain we're working in. And so we've got some code here. You know, I'm going to go get some animal, and then I'm going to ask it to walk and jump. The interesting thing for me is, is I think a lot of these. Uh, I don't know about those earlier articles, but I'm, I'm going to think less about like what the code looks like when I type, like you know, class dog extends animal and that sort of thing. And instead, focus on on the method dispatch. Like when, when we ask our object to do walk, like like what actually happens? And because um, I, I think for me that's kind of a more interesting way to think about it. And then how I write the code is is kind of a secondary artifact of that. So what happens in a class-based world when we do this? Well, so you know people say Java is stati a static language and this sort of thing. There's still actually some dynamic sort of runtime lookup that happens. Uh, in Java and, and virtual methods in C++, um, when you do the walk method, because you have to go find where it's at, and we'll show where that is. Uh, but what they they use is uh, technically Java doesn't use this term, but C++ is is virtual tables. And uh, oh yes, I should have put this slide first. So here here's our little class and you know animal dog extends whatever you know pretty simple. But what V tables end up being uh, is the boxes on the right. Um, that uh, kind of encode, encode what our classes are, right? So uh, we say, you know, I, I want my animal to walk. Where do we know the walk code is? We have to go find the walk code. The first, so the first step is we do know that our animal is, is a dog. So we jump from the little a1. You know, let's pretend that says a1.walk. So we, we jump from the a1 object, which is, you know, uh, I, I misspelled Harry. This should be the name. It's not Harry's. But two hours, Harry. Um, but, but we go to the uh, we go to the dog D table, and you say like, hey dog D table, do you have a, a walk method? And you're like, no, I do not have a walk method. Okay, so the way classical inheritance works, and I don't have little arrows drawn here, but we know that the dog extends the animal table uh, class, right? So then you go to the next box, and you're like, hey animal D table, do you have a walk method? And animal D table says, yes, I do. So then that's that's the method that uh, that actually gets run. And what is the next thing? Oh yes, good. This is what I thought it would say. Uh, so why do we do this? Uh, the, the the reason we do this is polymorphism, which uh, sounds really fancy, but really just means we can have more than one walk method, right? So so when we're building a code base, we can have our dog walk a different way than the cat. I don't know how different that is in, in reality, but you know in theory you could. 
And um, yeah, same thing. That, like you know, a one dot jump for a dog will do something for a cat. And it lets your code be generic. You, you know, you can have a whole bunch of animals, and you can ask them all to jump. Uh, but without your code having some sort of magical switch statement here, you can you know magically find the right uh, jump method. So that's why uh, you you know in the class-based dispatch and inheritance world, uh, we kind of go through this this lookup. And yeah, so to succinctly state it, we start with the first class, that first V table box, and then you just kind of walk up the parent classes. You know, in our example, we only had one. Uh, there might be, you know, every Java code base has 20 level class hierarchies. Uh, but uh, uh, okay, so that's class based. Uh, so prototype based. Let's let's look at how that uh, that looks. So the code will look a whole lot alike. Uh, I get to use let now, which is hipster, and say uh, walk and let, or, or walk and jump. And so same thing. Like we call a dot walk. What happens? Uh, so I've got the same sort of boxes, but it's a little bit different. Uh, so what happens when the, when the JavaScript runs time says, you know, I want to walk? Uh, the first step is it actually checks uh, the A1 box uh, first. It says, like, you know, does this object have a, uh, a walk function directly on the object? Uh, if it does, it would execute that. Uh, for here, we, we pretend we, we don't. So I don't have an arrow drawn, but again, we go to the, the second. We go to the dog prototype, right? So we go look in the dog prototype. Do you have a walk function? It says no, we don't. So then we go to the animal one, and we find the walk function there. So, and, and we'll kind of dig into the differences uh, later. But there's a lot of similarities, right? I, I mean, you're kind of walking through these boxes, just looking for uh, looking for a method. And uh, so, yeah, I'm going to skip the polymorphism thing because this is this is also polymorphism, right? It's, it's being able to have different methods for different objects. Uh, but stated succinctly, we start at the objects, and then we walk up uh, the prototypes. And so yeah, so let's talk about what changed. Um, because in a lot of ways, you know, I, I think they're fairly similar, you're walking boxes. Uh, but obviously the, 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 the biggest difference is that the prototype had an extra step, right? You know, on the class base we just had two, two steps, and on the prototype uh, we had three. Uh, and I have both here, so... Um, yeah, I should have drawn little arrows, but you can see that, that the kind of the class one is on this side, and we just go one, two, and the prototype one, we actually check three. So, you know, let, let's think about that. Is, is, that a, um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And what does it let me do? So it, it lets you define, like, per object behavior, right? Like, you, you could have two dogs, but this dog walks very differently than this dog, or, or this cat walks very differently from this cat. And, uh, and you would do this by, you know, directly on your object saying, like, I've got this very special walk function that's different from my other dogs, right? And so, you know, I don't know, is this, this reason about whether this is good or bad. Uh, on one hand, it, it is just more polymorphism, right? Like, like the goal of poly polymorphism is to be able to switch out the methods that you call, and, and we really just added another layer. Uh, and so is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and I think here it just kind of it comes down to your perspective. Um, you know, I, I've got a ton of old school, you know, class-based OO in me that's like, I, I've got a dog running around there that behaves different than every all, all my other dog types, right? Like, is, is, is that going to be surprising to, you know, programmers that are thinking of, of dog types and that sort of thing? Um, but on the other hand, you know, maybe it is, and we'll work to get to this uh, a little later, uh, maybe it does uh, let you do uh, novel things, because it actually does. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the big first difference, you, you know, is you've got an extra step. This is basically a, an extra step to do uh, unique kind of per object behavior, if you want to. Uh, second main difference is when these boxes are, are created. So uh, if you think of like the Java, well, uh, you know, Java static side of things, uh, the boxes here um, are very much fixed, like they're, they're, they're made uh, by the compiler. So you go run some Java code and, you know, compile you know, Java C, my Java file to class file, and that's what gets gets created, right, the, these boxes. So I, I drew a line down the center, so, so there's very much a distinction between, like, you know, here are my JVM objects that are created at runtime, right, the, you know, these are my 100 employees or my 100 dogs or whatever, and then here are my classes, my, my V tables, my classes that I just cannot change. And, um, 
yeah, so that's, that's how the Java side works. What, is, what about the prototype side? The prototype side, there is no line in between the two. They're, they're all really just objects, right? So your, your A1, which is you know, your, your dog kind of instance, it, it is a specific dog, uh, is an object. It's a map. You can put whatever you want in it. Uh, it's hooked up to the dog prototype, but the dog prototype is also just an object. You know, it's, it's this uh, yeah, dog.prototype.jump. You could put whatever you want into said prototype. So these are no longer the, the boxes that we walk through. Uh, you can touch them. You can do whatever you want with them. You can hook them up in various creative ways. You can put things in. You can take things out. You can do it in a for loop. Uh, you know, you can do whatever you want. And so let's think about the same sort of thing. Is this good or bad? Okay. Um, I think it, you know. I, I don't think it one way is 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 distinctly better or worse. It's just a uh, perspective of uh, it's perspective. So uh, pros and cons. So on the on like the non dynamic side, in terms of you know here are fixed boxes. Uh, the traditional answer has been like you need those for tooling. Like you need those for your IDE. You need those for your code browser, right? Because they're fixed boxes and, and they're fixed at compile time. So if you want to get clicky click, you know, through your code base. Uh, you need those, right? Because that's that's how your, your tooling is going to going to do it. Uh, I'll talk a little bit later about this, but, but TypeScript is is and flow is starting to change that a little bit. But that's traditionally been the um, kind of the rationale uh, for class based. Uh, you know why you might prefer that uh, on the prototype based. Uh, you know since those boxes aren't fixed, what's really tempting about that is you can do all sorts of novel of, uh, abstractions, right? Like if you have some sort of abstraction. Uh, like a mix-in or like a, um, I don't know, aspect-oriented programming. I haven't seen that done in JavaScript, but you can do the same sort of thing. Uh, something that the, you know, there is no compiler, so, so you can do whatever you want. Like on the Java side of things, uh, if, if the compiler doesn't know about what you want to do, like you just, you, you can't do it, right? You can't go into the compiler and say like, create your boxes this way. Like I want my boxes laid out like that. Like you, you just get the boxes and you say thank you. You, you can't really change them. Uh, and so if you come up with this sort of new, you know, way of organizing your code, you still have to shimmy it into the boxes. Uh, on the prototype side, you can shimmy the boxes however you want, right? So, and the interesting thing here is, is that that's really powerful, um, but, uh, is, you know, with power comes responsibility sort of thing. Like, like I think this is part of what, for, for me anyway, leads to like, you know, lack of ability to reason about certain things. You know, like, can this JavaScript object do this or that? I uh, don't really know. It can do you know, all sorts of things. Uh, so it, it really does give you a lot of flexibility. Uh, so that was the second major difference, uh, is when the boxes are created. Uh, and now the, the third difference is not as large, but it's interesting to talk about, um, is that in the class-based world, uh, all of the state is on the, on the left side of the diagram, right? And all of the behavior is on the right. So all methods are always on this side, right? Methods always have to go in a little V table and they can never go anywhere else. And uh, any of your fields, like your names and your sizes, they ha always have to go on the left. Um, and, and that's just kind of, well, there's, we'll pretend that that is how it is. Um, whereas on the prototype side, they, they don't have this distinction at all. Like you, you can, uh, you know, if you're doing a field resolution, let's pretend, you know, the, the size of your animal is a field. Uh, you'll check with your A1, but then you'll, you'll walk up the prototype chain if it's not there, just like you would for a method, right? Uh, which is really interesting. It means that, you know, if, if you know all of your cats are five pounds, you, you can put, like, your size, which is, like, typically be, like, a state-ish sort of thing, uh, on your prototype, and then all of your cats get that size for free. And so, same sort of thing. Let's think about if this is good or bad. And... Um, there is, so the one thing that you do have to be careful about is it's easy for this to make memory leaks. Uh, because since that, that, proto, that cat prototype is shared by all of your cats, uh, if you have a shared data structure, like a list, uh, that you put stuff in, you, you, it might look like, uh, I'm using this mice eating sort of thing, you, you know, I, I might think that my two cats are eating different mice, but they're on the prototype, so, so they all end up in the same, in the same thing. Um, which is, you know, one of those, those things that you can just catch with code reviews and that sort of thing. I, I did enough Ember work where they had a, uh, they had a linter against this sort of thing because you, you would, you know, you don't want your model objects to all of a sudden be sharing state and that sort of thing. But, so if, you, if you're careful about that, um, you have to watch out for that. 
But uh, otherwise, I don't think this is really that big of a deal. I mean, it's it's nice, or you know, I I, I think it's fine. It's, it's just a difference, but I don't think it's a strong strong pro or a strong con uh, for either one. I'm fairly ambivalent about that. I'm going super quick. So uh, we'll see if this takes longer. So there. Part of the reason that these articles, I think, are as complicated as they are um, is there's also kind of this tangent that, that you guys might have to correct me here on, on there being this notion of different types of, of inheritance in JavaScript uh, about prototypical inheritance, prototypal, sorry, I've been saying prototypical, uh, I have to say <laughs> prototypal, uh, even though they're, they're a little bit synonyms, but, but not quite synonyms, not synonyms. They mean the same thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, right. And competitive inheritance, which is also, I've never really heard the word competitive inheritance before. So I'm like, well, what is that? Uh, so let's talk about the difference between prototype inheritance and can, can, concatenative inheritance. So <coughs> prototype inheritance, prototype declaration, is exactly what we looked at. It's where you have the different boxes, right? You, you've got a, uh, a cat instance, and you've got a cat prototype and an animal prototype. And, and uh, it's delegation because you use prototype delegation because you're going through the prototypes. You know, you could have two prototypes, you could have ten prototypes, you just kind of keep going through the prototypes until you find the right one. And uh, there's kind of two ways to do this. Uh, nowadays we can use a fancy little ES6 syntax uh, when you do class dog extends animal that's really behind the scenes setting up these prototype chains for you. Um, so it'll do this little, you know, the dog prototype prototype. <laughs> Uh, is the animal prototype. So, so what that means is if somebody, you know, you're looking for the walk method in the dog prototype and you don't have it, then you check the dog prototype's prototype and then the animal prototype. Um, but, it w which you used to have to kind of set up by hand, but, but the ES6 syntax just kind of made it, magically makes this all work, which is great. Uh, the blog posts also talk about, uh, you know, I, I think to a certain extent, uh, anything with the word class is, is like seen as a bad thing by certain people. And so you can, you can do the same sort of notion with this little object create, which is interesting. Um, so th this does really highlight how the prototypes really are just objects, right? Like we, we can start out with a var animal, it's, it's just a map, it's just a hash of, of a walk function, right? And it, it, it's just a, well it's not a JSON object because we have a function in there, but it, it looks like any other JavaScript object. And by passing it to object create, we've, we've said, you know, it doesn't change animal. Animal is just still the same old object, but now we're going to use it as a prototype. It's our prototype for our dog now. So if we ask our dog to jump, uh, what, did, what am I doing there, John? Am I missing an equals? Oh yeah, I think I, think I, I, think I should have a dog.jump equals function. Uh, so, so that's kind of how you would then um, write you know, subclass methods uh, on, on your dog prototype. You, you would say, uh, I've got a dog. This is not a dog instance. It's, it's my dog type. And so if I want my dogs to jump in a certain way, I'm going to define a function on those. And again, this is just, it's just an object uh, that I can then use again when I create my A1, which is my actual dog, you know, my, my very dog uh, instance. Uh, and then it's, it's chained all the way through these objects. Um, the guy also wanted to use the term differential in so it, it took me a long time to bet that I really think this is the same thing. It, it, what, what the reason he word uses the term differential is that you start with animal and then you add the differences, right? So a, a dog is an animal, but I'm going to add the difference of it jumps differently, right? Uh, or a uh, or however else you, you want to differentiate uh, your object from the other objects. So this is prototype inheritance. There's technically this other thing that you can do. Okay, what is? Yeah, this is just showing. Prototype inheritance. I don't think there's anything useful about like this without your create. So there's also this this prototype concatenation, um, which I don't, I don't want to use the term inheritance, but it's, it's kind of a way to achieve the same thing, which is you can reuse functions, but not by setting up your prototype chain. You just pass them around everywhere and assign them directly on your objects. So you might have same same, same thing. We've got an animal that's our you know our walk function and a dog that's our jump function. If you use object.assign, which is the, the, the cool way to do it because you're not using the class keyword, um, you start with an empty object, but then you, uh, you copy, if you're not worried of linking them up, it just goes through every property on, on animal and says, okay, put that on, on the hash, and so it starts out empty. Now do the same thing on dog, go through every one and put it on, on that as well. And so what you end up with 
is really one giant object. Like, like the A1 dog just has everything on it directly in its map, right? So there's no prototype chaining, there, there's, there's nothing like this. Uh, so this is the, the object that assigned or the concatenated approach. And um, just copy all the methods in one spot. So there's a few interesting things about this. And the, one of the guys posted just really, really liked this. Uh, because in theory, it, it, it gets away from all of the, the problems of, in, of inheritance of, uh, where you can run into problems with inheritances if you need, you need to go up the tree different ways, right? And uh, basically, because there's no tree, you just like shove things directly onto your object, you can do whatever you want, right? You, you're not limited by this notion of, you know, this class extends that class or that sort of thing. Um, it does allow mixins, which are really nice. So, so mixins are just a way of, of kind of doing, you know, multiple inheritance of, of taking methods from multiple places and, and using them on your object. And, um, you know, you just do that by putting them directly on your object, right? Um, my, uh, so, so yeah, so in theory, you avoid all of the fragile base class and fragile, so, so people that complain about the fragile base class problem, I, I, I have a little bit of an issue with that because I, I think that you, you, if you're doing prototype delegation, you have the same thing with a fragile base prototype, right? Like, like if, if I was in Java and I was gonna write, you know, 10, 10, uh, 10 layer deep inheritance hierarchy, uh, you can do the same thing with prototypes. You can you, you could work your way into bad design that had ten layers of prototypes. Um, so you, you'd have a fragile based prototype problem. Uh, so the assertion is that you know we, we, we avoid that by just shoving everything here. Um, and may, maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but um, I don't think it really avoids the problem because you, you, you still kind of have this notion of of these these large things just magically coming together. And, and what does that even mean, really? I guess. Um, so I'm not entirely, it's like, yeah, you, you're, I don't know, this just seems too very complex. Actually, it's not complex, it's very simple, but it seems dirty, I guess. Um, so those, those are my two tangents. I'm going super quick. Any questions on any of the concatenative or prototype things? So if you had uh, any two objects, dog and animal, they could find the same method. <coughs> yes. Concatenation, is it the last one then? Uh, I think it's, it's either first or last one, so I don't actually know which one. Um, at that, at that point, the, the blog post will say, like, it's, it's great because it's just the last one wins. But the fact that I don't remember which, whether it's the first one wins or the last one wins, is, that re is it really a solution? I mean, like, yes, it will pick one. But when I've got a code base that's, you know, 100,000 lines of code and I need to reason about, yeah, I don't know. So, no, it picks one, but I don't remember which. Write unit tests and then, you know, hopefully it'll catch. It's the one furthest to the right. So you pass multiple arguments right there. Yeah, you do multiple, uh, and so it would take the last one? Yeah. You think? Yep. Okay, okay. The weird thing about object design, I don't know, in my experience, is that it doesn't do a deep merge, it only does a top level merge. Yes, right, so, so, so it's fine for copying over methods, but if, okay. you, if you're copying over like a, uh, a list uh, that has model objects in it, or, or some sort of it data structure. It doesn't merge them. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, and, and, uh, and shares it. So, yeah. so, so yes, yeah, so it's, it's not an actual copy. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's not actually useful. It's useful for this, because you know your functions are um, <coughs> copyable. I mean, they're not really, they don't get copied, but, but yeah. Uh, no, yeah, that is a good point. And actually, yeah, you see object assign all over the place. Uh, like, like you, know, you know, in terms of not just using it to set up this little, you know, mix in composition con concatenative inheritance, but, you know, all the time to, to merge, you know, DTOs and this sort of thing. So it is, uh, it's kind of interesting how you can use that same primitive to do, you know, both those sort of everyday sort of tasks on DTOs, and then also like your own inheritance, right? It, it is kind of a, uh, a powerful notion, uh, primitive. Um, yeah, any other questions about, you know, prototype or, uh, or uh, concatenative or the other one? Um, I had to throw in a, a TypeScript tangent. Uh, because TypeScript is it's, it's uh, so annoyingly powerful that it is starting to <laughs> negate some of the traditional, you know, uh, you know, Java safety blankets of like I, I need I need class files to get my tooling right. Um, insofar as and not only that, but but it's it's um, you know it, it can do all of the tooling issues, but uh, the type system is getting so advanced that they they can actually model this sort of mix-in behavior right. So. This first example, you see this little return type here of like dog and flyable. This is this is this is a uh, union, right? Um, 
where it's going to say like whatever I return, uh, yeah, you, you know, it can do whatever dot could do, could do, but now it can also fly, right? And um, so, so you're almost like making up types on the fly, right? And, and, and combining them. Uh, so you really can, uh, you know, in, in my old school Java world view, all, all of these like I'm just going to take an object and put methods on it. And how would anybody else in my code base know I've done that? Like, like I've done this mysterious thing that, uh, to me, so what are, you know, principles you need to uh, avoid is like principle of, of least surprise, right? Like don't do surprising things. And so to take an object and be like, oh, it magically does these other things, uh, like in the old school Java world is very surprising. But TypeScript means you can actually model that now. So, so actually it's not as surprising. Right now I, I've, I've been told that you know, I'm getting back something, I'm getting back a dog that can fly. At least I know that now. Um, and my tools know that. Uh, so that is really cool. Uh, the bottom example is really the same thing, but even more just kind of mind bendingly awesome. And so far as um, we make a mixin function, and I didn't actually do the implementations because they're you know they're not as important as the fact that the type system can represent this. Um, but let's pretend we type in a dog. We pass in a type t, and then this is a generic. So so we don't even know what this t is. It, it could be flyable. It could be who knows, right? Uh, but it's, it's generic, we'll just magically merge those together. And so then when you call it, we, we can pass in a T that has whatever we want. It could have new field, it could have names, it could have addresses, it could have whatever we want. And out the other side, we get a doc that now we can, we can set the new field on and it's type safe. Uh, which is just really impressive um, for a type system to do that. Uh, so it, it's starting to... Um, yeah, you know, blur, blur the lines a little bit on, on some of the magical things that you could do on the prototype side of things uh, by at least representing them and, and making them less surprising and more documented, uh, which, which to me are good things. Uh, any questions about the TypeScript sort of tangent or snippets? Have you um, seen any of the uh, conditional typing stuff that they just added? Yes. Uh, yeah, I haven't actually written any code uh, or samples that use it yet. I've, I've done a little bit with the map types. Those are fun. Uh, oh, I've got another blog post. If I go too quickly, I'll show you my other blog post. Now I'm motivated to go faster. <laughs> uh, uh, where uh, I use some of the math types, but not the conditional ones yet. No, those go, those are. It's really impressive is, is how much they're still uh, inter, uh, innovating on the type system, right? Like when they first came out, uh, type first came out, it was very much like boring OO type system sort of stuff, right? Like, like this looks like the, uh, I don't, you know, it, it, looked, it was still prototype based, so it didn't look, you know, exactly like Java or exactly like C Sharp or whatever, but you're like, yeah, you know. But then they keep knocking out releases of like, you know, and, and cutting edge type systems, uh, type system features that aren't in any other production language and that work really well and so far like haven't killed the code base. Like uh, I lived through Scala that um, had all sorts of advanced type system uh, features but uh, the compiler was written by grad students and kind of sucked. It, it was slow, and, and, and they do all sorts of really awesome stuff in the type system, but your day-to-day -day life as a developer was just not that amazing on a large code base. Uh, I've not used TypeScript on a large code base yet, but I've not heard any grumblings in the community about uh, you know, their magicalness not you know, being a performance issue or, or that sort of thing. So really impressive, really impressive. In each uh, case there is D1 implicitly <laughs> Uh, an instance of the function? Uh, say that again? In each of those examples, is D1 implicitly a, a, an instance of the function? Uh, D, D1 is a previous dog that I've made. So, so pretend that there was a line up here where I said, like, let D1 equals new dog. Okay. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm playing with the dog. And so I've got this, this is the same the same thing with the, with the uh, uh, that first, you know, how the difference is in the boxes, the, the prototype thing has a check on that first box. Uh, this lets us say that, like you, you had a dog, and, and uh, this specific dog, and, and it now can fly. No other dog in your code base can fly, but this one can. And um, yeah, I mean, at least you told me that, so it makes it better. I might be. Oh. Uh, yeah. Any other uh, TypeScript things other than so? I think this is my last slide. Actually, I have one more slide. Uh, but the interesting thing is, so I kind of went quickly going over the differences because they're, you know, I think they're pretty easy to explain. Um, I've also been thinking about them a lot over the last week, so maybe that helps. But 
you know, at the end of the day, if you think about it on this box, sort of, you know, I'm just going to check boxes and I'm going to move methods around. It's it's not actually as complex as maybe I thought it was uh, going into it, which is nice, and, and I achieved my goal of, you know, kind of internalizing these things when I set out to do the blog post. But for me, the big question is like, will this actually change how you structure your applications, right? You know, it, it, which to me is kind of what some of these blog posts were, were, were kind of implicitly asserting is, is that, you know, somehow this class-based approach leads to, you know, um, structuring your code such in a way that's inflexible or, or leads to pain in the long term and that sort of thing. And that, you know, if you use prototypes to do it, it it's, it's not that. So, like, what did that actually look like? And, and again, I, I'm a visual, so I think of, you know, my objects in memory, you know, when I'm running my JavaScript VM, like how many employees do I have floating around in memory? How many orders do I have? And what, you know, I, let's say I've got some business logic classes, I've got a claims engine, and you know, those are those are instances in memory too. And like, are, are those really going to change that much? Like, like you know, I, I'm a big fan of domain-driven design um, and kind of this ubiquitous language where you know the code uses the same nouns and verbs that that the business users use, right? So, like, if if the, the business user calls this, you know, I don't know, whatever your business domain is, if they have a term, you should try and use that term too. As long as it's not a marketing name, because they always change marketing. <laughs> but uh, other than that, um, so right, so, so so when I call methods and, and I'm gonna, you know, name my nouns, are my nouns really gonna change that much? And uh, especially when you start considering uh, your organization, you, you, you know, like usually your nouns, you, you want to follow things like single responsibility principle, principle least surprise, and all of these other sort of best 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 practice OO things. That is kind of my last point. Like at the end of the day, these are both just modeling objects, right? And and, and to me, the way the objects look and memory at runtime, or, or you want them to try and look pretty much the same, because in theory, there's kind of one conceptual view that is maybe not the best view, but uh, you know makes things make sense, and, and whether you have to write a bunch of Java classes to get there, or TypeScript classes, or, or do a lot of objects to sign on the prototypes to sign side of things, um, I think they look a lot alike, or I think they should look a lot alike. And if they look really different, um, I think that's puzzling, and, and I wonder if you're doing one or the other wrong, um, I guess. And, and that's basically my assertion, and where I will pretty much end the talk. Uh, I don't know if we want to record this session or not, um, or I can jump over to my TypeScript map types. Um, but um, is is feedback from you guys? Like, like, have you seen you know in your own experiences? Like, wow, I did this in this prototype sort of way that is fundamentally different of how I would model them. Um, you know, in, in more of the class world. Um, so feel free to speak up if if you've had, or or you know we can always uh, catch up over you know later or whatnot. But otherwise, I'm done. This one question be. Uh Performance-wise, I mean, is the whole oh. class, you know, you oh, the class yeah. the way, is uh, it still under the doing the same exact thing? That actually is, is a good question. Um, so in theory, the, there's uh, there is a performance difference, uh, and this is uh, I had this in my blog post, but I didn't think it was that. It's a little bit tangential. In, in theory, it's not as big of a performance difference. And it shouldn't really matter unless you're you know writing a physics engine in JavaScript. Um, which some people do. Uh, what one do I want to show? Um, maybe this one? So, let's do one where they're both on the same side. I, I have one, yeah, here they're both on the same one. Uh, so, the, the, the only kind of performance difference is that, um, you know, so, so Java is a just-in-time compiler, right? And so, so it starts out interpreting uh, which is slow, and then it watches what the code does, and then it makes machine code later, right? And the machine code is specific to your machine and uses your architectural opcode, whatever special fast fast sort of thing. Um, so each of these, uh, and actually it's at the method level, uh, but each of these tables, um, in time, if you use the methods enough, will become optimized machine code, right? Like assembly opcode, whatever, whatever. Uh, JavaScript will do the same thing. Um, that's you know what V8 will do, and, and I'm sure the, the Mozilla ones do it too. And I'm a little bit behind on where their state of the art is, but they'll try to do the same thing. That they'll try to infer that the animal prototype, you know, like the, this walk method. Uh, you know, you start out interpreting, but then after a little bit, uh, you want to turn it into machine code. You want to turn it on code. The annoying thing with with prototypes on the performance side of things is is that as soon as you touch any field over there. 
you, you have to undo all of your performance optimizations because you've changed the shape of your object, right? So, so like you, you, you're basically making classes on the fly-ish, right? So, so what started out as being, whereas you know, over on the Java side of things, like I, I know this, this object is always this class. I, I don't have to watch if it changes or watch if it gets a method or, or um, actually Java does have to de-optimize. What's kind of interesting is, let's say you started out with, with these classes uh, Java does do runtime class loading, so let's say after five minutes of, of running your server or your desktop app or whatever, you happen to load another, um, let's say you're a pet store, I don't know, we're talking about pets, uh, that has like uh, parrots, I don't know. Wow, I don't know why I picked parrots, but um, <laughs> now all of a sudden there, there's another parrot v table. Well, there's another parrot v table. Actually, Java does have to go back and, and undo some of the opcodes that it made here because they might be invalidated by, you know, now there's three subtypes. So, so some of the super native optimizations I did here, I, I might have to undo. So the JVM has instrumentation to watch if that ever happens, uh, and then redo these optimizations. So the V8 uh, JavaScript VMs have to do the same thing, but, but it's not only what do prototypes show up, it's like every time you modify your object. And so uh, I did WIP for a while, same thing, don't judge me. Um, and they, they had the same sort of thing where they did a compiler optimization of when they would they would spit out uh, that you write a job file and you get you get JavaScript out. That's what Quip did. And when they spit out their JavaScript files, they would they would always assign their fields in a very specific way, and that and then and then and always assign all of them in the constructor, because that gave the VAVM the best chance to be like, oh, here's your class. You know, in your constructor, you've assigned all of the ten fields that you have, or eight fields, whatever. Here's your class, and, and now um, you, you might change the values of those. You, you, might, you might change your name from Null to Fred or whatever, but you, you're not adding new things to your map. And it uh, had a demonstrable, at the time, a you know, demonstrable um, effect on performance. So technically, yes, it matters in, in the small, but I, you know, I think for those of us writing CRUD applications that like you know, turn things red on the screen every <coughs> once in a while, it probably doesn't actually matter that much. But it is interesting from a technical perspective. Is that true when you use the US6 class then still? Does the um, actually, that's a good question. I don't know if the way, like, you know, the babbles and all of these things, the way they output the, the ES6 class syntax, if they, if they use that same wit trick of, like, you know, if I assign all of my fields in the constructor, um, then it should, like, get the magic, you know, V8 hint that, like, oh, yeah, you're, you're this class and you're off to the races. Uh, I actually don't know that. Right, does anybody else know? My understanding is that the new V8s, um, if you don't transpile down, you just use native class syntax. Oh. They're very optimized for those code paths. That makes a ton of sense. So, yeah, so it's considered like oh, best yeah. practice. The, 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 uh, the interesting tangent there is, is this sort of like, you know, the JavaScript VM always has to worry about your class changing shape. Uh, in theory, is one of the reasons why the V8 team went off and wrote the, the Dart language. Um, that they did, you know, it's still around. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting tangent as well. But but Dart was kind of this, the V8 team writing an almost Java, you know, virtual machine uh, that explicitly took out these sort of things of like, oh well, JavaScript decided this ten years ago, and turns out that's a bad bad idea uh, at, at high performance. So uh, so yeah, that, that yeah, that's interesting. That makes tons. Of, I hadn't made that that uh, connected those dots yet. But yeah, I mean, if you keep things in the native syntax. Uh, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Cool. What's WIT? Uh, Google Web Toolkit. Oh, so okay. it was this. Uh, <coughs> how short can I keep this tangent? GWT. GWT. Yeah, it's it's the you know okay. Google Web Toolkit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pros and cons. I'm judging you now. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that I know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I should have feigned ignorance. I don't know. What is interesting. Uh, almost all of the good apps out there suck. Uh, they, they do. I, I assert that we work one that did not, but uh, that, that's for a conversation afterwards, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm about a half hour early. If uh, there's any other uh, questions, we can just end now. Um, is there, uh, is yeah. there anything on either side of this diagram that would prevent the the language implementation from uh, at object level the A1s yeah. 
making a list of all the fields that are mm. north of it, if you will. Yeah, like reflection, saying, say, say, uh, what fields do I have, and, and that's sort of thing. And so, as soon as you call walk, mm -hmm. a1.walk, you would get an address in memory to go to, which would happen in uh, walk yeah, case to be an animal. Yeah, that's basically what the virtual machine is doing for you. Uh, with all of the sanity checks of like, you know, what happens if you change your prototype, and what happens if, uh, you know, the parrot class gets loaded and, and changes the, you know, the, well, I, I don't know if that would happen. But yeah, so, so no, yes, that is basically what happens. Uh, and yeah, you, you, you know, to the point where you would do it yourself, it's kind of, the VM's going to beat you to that sort of thing, so you might as well let it do its thing. Yeah. Uh, but that is conceptually exactly what's happening. Yeah. I have a Java question. You oh, this is the Java this is yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How how would um, creating an anonymous class yeah. that extends from dog affect your picture on the right? Does uh, that still create a V table? Yeah, even it, it just anonymous? makes a little. Uh, so the way the the anonymous classes work is is they actually well you you've probably seen it because um, they're all over the place. But when you see class files with dollar sign in the name. Right, so you'll see like you know dog and then dog dollar sign one and then dog dollar sign two. Well, so that dollar sign one is the V table for just the first anonymous class in your class file, and the dollar sign two is for the second. They don't have a name, so they just do them based on order, uh, which is I don't know what it is because uh, because you get a ton of them and then you know it, it means if you change the order, it, I mean it all works out in the end, but it's it's just kind of an ugly way of doing it. But yeah, it's it's just more little V tables. Uh, they don't have great names, but that is what it is. Uh, so they're still, you know, they're, they're anonymous. Uh, they, they look a little bit like, you know, I, I know the TypeScript has this new little inline class anonymous syntax sort of thing, um, but I haven't used enough to, to know a ton about it. Um, but no, the, the, the Java version is still very much, yeah, you just get a V table, it's just unnamed, and it's still very static, um, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Java questions, I know, that was nice. <laughs> I was going to say, this, I've done a ton of Java, that was going to be one of my uh, intros that, that I forgot, is that I've done a ton of Java stocks over the years and recognized a lot of you. From there, this is my first JavaScript one, so be gentle, uh, <laughs> sort of thing. Um, <coughs> I'm curious how many people have, like, so on the Java side, right, you have, part of the reason that you do inheritance in general is just to, because that's the easiest way to pass encapsulation pieces around. And in Java, all that you have are those classes. So if you want to abstract away, you don't have a whole lot of tools other than like, it's the kingdom of bounds is the first thing yeah. you use. Um, but in JavaScript, I don't see that a whole lot. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm curious how many people have class hierarchies or prototypal hierarchies that are more than like one or two levels deep. That's a great question. In JavaScript. Uh, it feels like I you don't do that in Java. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I chuckled over the responses. Go ahead, go ahead, Nick, and then uh, just said you've never written Dojo one. Uh, this might be true, <laughs> but but it feels like in in JavaScript you have other abstractions, right? You can pass functions yeah. around. You can like you have different ways of um, preventing the the Spring yeah. framework, you know, abstract factory bean, factory factory uh, bean uh, factory. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's what you're talking. About. Right, where so in, but, but because yeah. that you have those other flexible pieces, yeah. I tend not to see giant hierarchical chains, even with ES6 like class yeah. syntax. Available. I did see, yeah, the, um, a little tangent on that a little bit. I saw a blog post from the Dan Abro, uh, Ambro, Abro, Abro. I've never had to say his name out loud before. <laughs> um, the React guy. The React guy. Yeah. Okay. And. Um, <laughs> He had a, in a, yeah, he had a post kind of along the lines of inheritance where he was saying that you, you should only ever extend once. Extend once. Like, like if you write a React component, he was talking about React components, of course, and let's say you, you've got a, a, a button class, it's okay for your button to extend a React component, because um, React component's a class that you can extend, but you should never, ever, ever have your, your blue button extend your button. Like, like as soon as you do two levels of inheritance, and I, that seemed, I don't know, I was, it rubbed me a little bit the wrong way. It seemed, seems like kind of a, uh, an overly strict um, sort of thing. I, I mean, I, I'm all for avoiding the you know, 20 levels deep, you know, whatever, 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 uh, you know, things that make people hate inheritance, but it seemed a little overly strict in my opinion. But, uh, 
But no, it does seem like you, you don't see it as much. Um, I'm trying to think, yeah, why else would, you, would they not have it as much? I mean, for one, uh, just like logistically doing more than, even doing one level of prototype chaining was a pain in the ass for a really long time before you had the ES6 class syntax, right? When you set up everything with prototype chains and you had to remember your constructors that I don't, I don't even know enough to talk intelligently about that other than they kind of sucked. And, uh, and, and so maybe <laughs> Just the fact that, that it was so painful in JavaScript for so long that people learned, you know, not to do it. Uh, and, and ES6 is still, you know, pretty new-ish, right? Um, that, that maybe the, you know, there hasn't been enough mindshare, like, oh, I, I could do this. Not, not that, you, you, you know, maybe that's actually a good thing, right? You, you, you've been people away from abusing inheritance, but um, I, I guess what that start, be? I think you'll start to see a pick up, for sure, once more, yes, more people start doing ES6. The other interesting thing was that before ES6, all of your user land class libraries were completely in incompatible, right? So if you use the jQuery extends and the, what was the, 37 signals had their own class library and, and so and so had, Dojo had their own class library, and Ember had their own class prototype. library. What's that? It's called Prototype. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you're right. That is, wow, that's kind of a mean joke in retrospect. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and, and you could never extend between the two. Right, so, so, so that was the other sort of thing of like, you, you couldn't pick up a, you know, an Ember component and extend it with, which even now, it, it, Ember is finally almost talking about fixing that. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah. Yeah, so no, it is interesting now that the ES6 stuff is out, and like, no, really, you could pick up a class from one, you know, NPM thingy and extend it in another one and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I think surely it will happen. I'm surely, I'm sure people will, do it well and do it not well, uh, just like any you know tool. But uh, yeah. Yeah. The factory factory thing is interesting. Yeah, I, I mean I don't know. Uh, it, it's one of the like you lose flexibility. ES6 classes have made your object hierarchies less flexible. Just because yeah. it, you know, it, yeah, to me it the, looks the, more classical. I, I haven't studied it deeply, but to me the, the, the reason JavaScript that you don't have the factory factories is because you can do dependency injection at the module level. Mm -hmm. So like on the JavaScript side, or on the Java side, you can't just pretend that this import, you know, if I import, you know, comlang database connection, uh, you, you, that is your real database connection. And when you run your tests, like you, you can't do anything about it. So then you need an interface, you need a factory, you need a factory, factory, factory. Yeah, uh, on the JavaScript too. side, yeah, you, you can monk with your imports and, and be like, oh no, I, I, you know, when I run this test, I'm not actually going to import the physical <laughs> database connection, it's going to be this mock thing, which is actually fairly powerful. I, I don't actually know how much I like it yet. I, I haven't done it enough to, is that to be like, yeah, that's, what's that? Is that still true with native ES uh, modules? Yeah, 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 I mean, you can hook into the module loading system in like Jest or whatever and say like, you know, for this test, I want this module to actually be this mock or this stub. Uh, when I execute, you know, yeah, at the very least, you hack it with like the STD ESM. Right, but I mean, when it's eventually native, oh, will that still be the same? Because like the way that we, we get around that is it's know, transparent and you know, green. Oh. Well, you M or something, you just rename it. Or rename it to whatever you right, want. Right, but in a test, you couldn't come up with the inputs that you You'd have to. I can do that in, in A and D because I can control. I can un yeah. register something and then re register something else in its place. So when it imports it, it gets this fake database connection. Yeah. I don't know. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, like, you know, the smell that I've always, like, back in my Java days, it was always preferred composition over inheritance. Not that I yeah. this was, like, evil, but that if you have a choice, you would prefer to, like, bring your. Dependencies in from somewhere else and yeah. compose and create like your you know create your abstractions that way. Yeah, and it feels much easier to do that, especially with like mix-ins and decorators. And, like you just have a lot of different tools on the JavaScript side that you traditionally haven't had with more static languages. Yeah, and it seems like that's part of the reason why I don't see giant like inheritance hierarchies. Yeah, that's interesting. Sounds right. I. I don't know. <laughs> you know, anec anecdotal evidence. Um, next next month at Nebraska JS. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we've had a few tangents. Any, any other questions or comments? Otherwise, uh, we can shut it down early. All right. Cool. cool. Thanks.